The man I'm about to speak with today has led Antigua and Barbuda since June 2014. In that time, he has forged a reputation as a straight-talking, decisive leader. On his watch, the economy of Antigua and Barbuda grew by an annualized rate of 4.42% between 2014 and 2019, though, like pretty much everywhere else, uh, that growth has given way to contraction in this era of the pandemic. His is among the first governments in this part of the world to introduce a vaccine mandate as a necessary step in the recovery from the damage caused by COVID. He is Gaston Alfonso Brown, and he's my guest today on The Conversation. Prime Minister, welcome. A pleasure. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Excellent. The obvious place to start, given that you are fresh from COP26, is this. Given what you've heard coming out of that, 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 that summit over the past few days, are you confident that on a big ticket item, such as the reduction of those subsidies, uh, those fossil fuel subsidies, that any meaningful action is poised to be taken? Well, let me say that um, the COP26 did not quite result in the ambitions that we anticipated. Uh, we all know that uh, um, the IPC, IPCC would have indicated that this decade is the last decade to get things right and to avoid the worst consequences of climate change. So we evidently had expected um, greater ambitions um, during COP26. Uh, nonetheless, um, incremental progress was made, but we did not see the type of ambitions necessary in order to contain global warming below 1.5 degrees. And that is extremely worrisome for small island states here in the Caribbean and certainly those in the Pacific and Indian Oceans, because we are in the front lines of climate change. And if temperatures are allowed to rise beyond 1.5 degrees, then our civilization will be in peril. But there is also broad implications for all countries, because many of these um, Countries they too have coastal communities, and those coastal communities will be destroyed. Uh, admittedly, they have greater resilience than we do. They're able to um, recover from these um, climate events far quicker than we can because of their superior financial and human resources, as well as the technology that they have. But nonetheless, um, climate change represents the most significant existential threat to all countries and to human civilization. So. We didn't quite see the commitments necessary, but at least we can say that we are on the right path. And the recent development uh, between China and the United States, in which they have now um, agreed to work together in order to um, come up with more ambitious plans in order to reduce the emissions, I think that that is certainly very important. Uh, admittedly, we didn't get the type of commitments to reduce subsidies. And that is one of the areas in which we need to see more progress because ultimately when they subsidize, as they continue to subsidize the fossil fuel industries, then what they're doing is that they undermine the, tra the transition into green energy applications. In fact, what is really required at this point is for increased subsidies for alternate energy solutions, because generally speaking, developing countries have difficulties accessing these um, green energy technologies because they're cost prohibitive. When you look at the cost of batteries, for example, um, many of us, even though we have um, solar plants, we do not have the necessary um, battery storage in order to provide 24-hour renewable um, energy. Yes. Um, yes, I, yes, I was just acknowledging what you're saying. You can continue. Yes. So, again, you know, these are some of the challenges that we're faced with um, in that, oh. you know, the, when you look at the actions in terms of subsidizing uh, fossil fuel um, energy firms, uh, it is incongruent with their stated goals and yeah. the objectives to increase, uh, let's say, to increase the ambitions and to uh, become carbon neutral by 2040, 2050. But, but here's the thing, but here's the thing, Prime Minister. I'm wondering if world leaders attempting to lead us out of this, this, this climate purgatory that looks to be on the cards. 
I'm wondering about the, 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 the battle, if you may call it that, between the industrialists who get these fuel, the, these fossil fuel subsidies, and the governments. Because I, I'm wondering if the industrialists are in lockstep with the governments, because I see it as an almost adversarial relationship. The governments can pledge all they want, but if the industrialists don't have the same idea or have the, have the same vision, then we'll be looking back at COP26 years down the line as a failure, like perhaps Copenhagen was or any of the previous. 25 cops? Well, there's a sophisticated um, game of diplomacy being played, and we're fully aware that there are many leaders who make these pledges knowing well that they will not be um, attained um, because they have these um, obligations to these fossil fuel firms. Uh, these fossil fuel firms, do they have these lobbyists who continue to um, control the narrative and the actions of uh, many leaders globally. Uh, so we cannot underestimate the uh, effects of these um, powerful lobbyists. Uh, but at the same time, I believe, though, that there is a global recognition that um, all countries, all companies, um, in fact, it must be an all-of-society approach for everyone to come together to fight this existential threat. But I'm pretty sure that there will be delays, there will be perhaps maybe some climate um, pariahs as well who may, you know, come with these... Um, <laughs> Uh, commitments that just do not uh, meet the requirements yep. of the international community to achieve um, the 1.5 degree goal. Uh, on the point, on the point, Prime Minister of Diplomacy, you mentioned it just now. Let me get right there. The, the, the fact that Antigua is a member of the Commission of Small Island States on Climate Change and International Law, ostensibly to claim compensation from the large emitters of green, greenhouse gas. Is this, uh, can this reasonably be looked at as a concession that diplomacy has failed, perhaps will fail, and the legal recourse is necessary to get the give that is necessary, that is required in this regard? Well, we would not go as far as stating that the voluntary efforts have failed, uh, but we think that in order to achieve um, you know, these ambitious goals and to ensure implementation, that we also need um, a legal mechanism, and especially on the issue of um, compensation for loss and damage. Uh, with, uh, these large polluters, they continue to sidestep the issue. So the issue of um, loss and damage uh, has not been given any serious attention. And we are operating on a basis that the polluter must pay. In fact, it is a well-known um, thought that um, he who injures must provide some level of restitution. And um, these, um, uh, let's say, tortious um, or tortious um, acts, acts of um, burning fossil fuel energy indiscriminately, um, we believe that there has to be some legal redress rather than to uh, leave um, you know, any form of um, assistance to voluntary acts uh, of charity. I mean, there must be some legal remedy to also serve as a disincentive for those who continue to pollute this, uh, indiscriminately. Uh, they ought to know that uh, where they continue to uh, indiscriminately uh, utilize these carbon fuels, uh, and that they create damage for small island states globally, that there are consequences. Yes. Unless there is a, is a legal pathway. And I'm afraid that the voluntary efforts, uh, even though we have made some gains on those voluntary yes. efforts, that they will not be enough to achieve the type of um, ambitions and the type of emission cuts that we would like to see. Your, your partner in this commission, uh, Tuvalu, uh, they, 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 there was a, a stunt uh, it was designed as a stunt. It was a stunt to make a presentation in, in, in almost knee-deep water to show the effects of climate change. You are well aware of what's happening in Madagascar, people in the south facing starvation because there's just been no rains and there's a, a severe food crisis there. The point to be made from all of that is this. There, there, there's something that you said on the floor of COP26 that, of course, a, a, a leader of a large, rich nation couldn't say, and it was to talk about the lack of scaling up or the absence of the scaling up of loss and mitigation funding, which, of course, people like you in charge of the countries of the typography and character that you are in charge of is a serious thing. So I say all of that to say, are you getting the support in this commission, the numbers to really make it worthwhile in your push and your, your pleadings to the law of the sea tribunal for this legal recourse to really have teeth to make the gains where diplomacy has not quite made those gains just yet? Well, it's still early days. Um, we only launched the commission a week ago. Uh, so far, we have had about, what, three members? 
And I'm hoping that um, the Caribbean countries in particular, that they will join in mass. The commission is open to membership from uh, all EOSIS countries. And um, the more members we have, the more effective um, the work of the commission will be, the more seriously uh, will be taken. And I think it's important to establish this legal mechanism to complement you know, those voluntary acts of charity, which invariably are inadequate. And I'll give you a case in point. Uh, when Barbuda was decimated, that's our sister island, Barbuda was decimated by Hurricane Irma four years ago. The recovery bill was 222 million US dollars. We have had so far up to about maybe 22 million US dollars in charitable contributions. But the balance of the bill remains to the government and people of Antigua and Barbuda. And that in itself has proven to be somewhat cost prohibitive to the extent that we have not fully recovered Barbuda. So if we're not careful and if we do not push for compensation for loss and damage, then small island states globally will find themselves in a vicious cycle in which we have to continue to more repeatedly to repair damage and economy, infrastructure and buildings. So it is a necessary, uh, let's say, pathway to be established in order to ensure that there's climate justice. Yeah, we have less than, we have about a minute left in this first segment, Prime Minister. Let me, let me ask you this one quickly. Your Sustainable Island Resource Framework Fund, I'm going to call it SURF. I'm not sure if that's the, the, the acronym you used. 2019, okay. it was birthed uh, to offer climate resilience funding, to make homes climate resilient, uh, climate resilient. You spoke of the Barbuda experience just now and how the recovery there has been retarded for, because of various reasons. But has the surf started yet to sink its teeth in or given the, the, the subsequent events, you haven't quite gotten that off the ground yet, making homes climate resilient in Antigua Barbuda? Yes, uh, our surf fund um, is working. Um, again, limited impact because there's not a lot of money, but we have been able to um, uh, provide um, concessional loans for a number of um, homeowners in low-lying areas. And there's a particular area in which we're now doing some infrastructure work to get the drainage um, right in order to um, avoid um, flooding. So yes, it is operational. It is providing some level of relief, but because of the limited funding, the impact is not as significant as one would have liked. And again, you know, we just have to do all we can to scale up funding because as the large countries continue the emissions and we overshoot the 1.5, then we now have to think seriously about um, adaptation funding to adapt to the effects of climate change. And as you know, adaptation requires a lot of funding. We have to build more resilient buildings um, and infrastructure. And uh, we have to also continue to push for external funding because we cannot come up with the full amount um, you know, that is required to adapt to the effects of, my, um, of climate change. Yeah, hold it right there. We're talking with the Prime Minister of Antigua and Barbuda, Gaston Brown, fresh from COP26. We're talking about climate change and, of course, how this part of the world, islands in this part of the world are being affected. We're going to continue this conversation after this break. Speaking with a Caribbean man, a Caribbean general, many of his supporters would call him Gaston Brown, Member of Parliament for St. John's City West, Prime Minister of Antigua and Barbuda, been at the controls since 2014 with his Antigua and Barbuda Labour Party. Prime Minister, your ambition to build another fund, your Climate Resilience and Development Fund, I write these things down to make sure I quote them correctly, uh, was to be funded significantly by your tourism accommodation levy, your TAL. I, I, when I saw that announcement, my ears perked because I thought, ah, this is novel. I, I looked at the rates and, of course, the number of tourists who come to Antigua and Barbuda, and I thought it, 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 the math, it would work itself out for where the math was concerned. 
But your TAL didn't get to fly in 2020 as announced. You rescheduled it to 2021. Uh, originally, you were projecting between 50 and 80 million to collect out of the TAL uh, from 2020. Uh, are your projections scaled down from the 2021 launch? And, all, and because you hadn't been able to extract as much as you thought from TAL, what has happened to that resilience and development fund? Well, that'll be an ongoing initiative. So whereas, you know, the implementation was delayed and we didn't achieve the, uh, let's say, the revenue that we anticipated, we expect it to be a significant, significant contributor to government's revenue. And that in itself will help to create the fiscal space that we would need to accelerate our transition into green energy um, applications. In fact, we have set a timeline of 2040 to become carbon neutral. Uh, by 2030, we hope to uh, eliminate the fossil fuel um, cars and replace them with um, electric cars. But at the same time, we need to have the type of fiscal space in which we can support that um, transition to green energy. And this is where the TAL becomes very important uh, to ensure that we have the necessary fiscal space to accelerate our transition into renewables. Uh, so, again, it is uh, an initiative that will continue perhaps um, for many decades and will be a significant source of funding for the government and people of Antigua and Barbuda as we seek to achieve our NDCs and to become carbon neutral by 2040. Yeah, you spoke about green energy. Let me, let me take you on on, um, on on renewable energy. You spoke about a, a 70 million US dollar uh, a program, which was made up uh, significantly of funding from Abu Dhabi for renewable energy. So I wasn't quite clear. Was that 70 million money that you were projecting to get over a, a few budget cycles, or is it money already in hand waiting to be spent? I wasn't clear. Right. So from the Abu Dhabi Investment Fund, we have had um, approximately 30 million US dollars approved, uh, 15 million US of which we have utilized. And uh, the other sources, including our own budgetary um, allocations, I believe to date that we would have invested in the region of about um, $70 million um, in renewables. Uh, so specifically to answer your question, uh, the total commitment from the Abu Dhabi Investment Fund is um, 30 million US dollars of which 15 has been utilized. And that project is currently being installed. It's a combination of wind and solar energy. And uh, you know, too, that they just launched another initiative of a billion US dollars. And I'm pretty sure that Antigua and Barbuda will avail it itself of further funding on the new um, facility that was launched by the UAE and IRENA. Listening to you on the world stage, Prime Minister, and looking at Antigua and Barbuda's membership of AOSIS and this new commission with Tuvalu, uh, one would say, well, Clearly, this is a prime minister who is deathly serious about climate change, especially given the nature of the country he leads. Uh, but, but, but if I square that with what you said about climate change in your, say, your 2020 budget presentation, 79 pages long, prime minister, you gave us two pages and one sentence on climate change. In 2021, you gave us nine sentences. Perhaps somebody would say, well, the, the prime minister's preaching is, is, is louder and more effective than his practice. <laughs> well, let's put it this way. It's not the quantity of the pages, but the quality of the articulations. And I believe that our commitment um, to climate change is as strong as any. And we continue to be at the forefront of this fight. Uh, we're doing so not only on behalf of the government and people of Antigua and Barbuda, but certainly for all um, small island states globally, and even um, developing countries, because um, they do have climate issues um, for uh, most developing countries. Uh, we have a problem accessing the appropriate um, green energy technologies because they're cost prohibitive. And, you know, we've been fighting to have some of those fossil fuel um, subsidies going to uh, renewables to make them more affordable. I mean, even in terms of acquiring EVs, uh, currently, those um, electric vehicles, they are beyond the means of the citizens of most developing countries. And we continue to advocate for uh, subsidies to that sector in order to drive down the price of um, EVs so that we can get rid of those um, fossil fuel vehicles. So again, our commitment um, should not be judged by the few pages that we have allocated to the issue of um, climate change in our budget statement.
Psychologists, Prime Minister, talk about so a, a phenomenon known as the finite pool of worries. And if, 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 basically what that is saying, where worries about one thing increase, worries about another thing decrease. I, I mentioned that to you to ask if among Antiguans, the, the, the average Trini, I hate saying average people, but you, you get the idea, average Trini, average Jamaican, average Bayesian, St. Lucian, Kittitian, so forth. If climate change is high in this finite pool of worries, given cost of living issues, worries about uh, education, health care, and so forth, putting food on the table, uh, climate change, our, our, our people are not, are, are not too chuffed about that. You, you get, do you get that sense from your chair as prime minister? Well, I accept that um, there is an information gap, and um, that is one of the challenges that we have as leaders to ensure that the um, information about climate change and the fact that it is the most significant existential threat facing all of humanity, that we need to plug that um, information gap and to ensure that we have more public awareness and educational programs in order to increase the awareness at the grassroots level. I will accept that I have seen many polls um, within the last um, several months, several years. And when you um, poll issues at the grassroots um, level, um, the issue of climate change is hardly mentioned as a significant issue. So the, the, the awareness at the grassroots level is definitely weak. And I believe that as people become more aware of this um, significant threat, that they will show a little more interest and a little more concern. But you're right, they're more concerned with the bread and butter issues at this point, even issues about public infrastructure, utilities, roads, and so on, and um, employment. Uh, but again, we have an obligation, uh, even those of you in the media, to help to um, bring some increased level of awareness to these threats, because I don't think people or people generally understand the magnitude of these climate threat threats. Yeah, let's talk tourism now, Prime Minister, because in 2020, uh, total visitor numbers, as the report came out of Antigua and Barbuda, overall numbers dropped by 62.5%, say 63%, stopover down 58%, cruise down by another 64%. Uh, that was 2020. How, how is that picture looking so far in 2021? We're just one month left in the year. Unfortunately, it's not significantly better. Uh, we had anticipated that 2021 would have been a far more productive year for us, and we'd have seen um, some improvement in tourism arrivals. Yes, there has been some improvements, but compared to uh, 2019, um, pre-COVID, I have to tell you that um, we're still significantly um, below, at least 50% um, below those arrivals. And um, it's an issue of great concern, but at the same time, we have made um, significant progress managing COVID. Uh, we have brought down the active cases. We have increased um, our vaccinations. And as a consequence, we have close to about 60% of the population now that is vaccinated, at least uh, 53, 54% fully vaccinated. So I believe that we've been in a far better position to move forward in 2022 with um, a greater level of um, predictability and to have a strong recovery. Uh, in 2022. Uh, but again, 2021 has been yet another difficult year for us financially, and even in terms of COVID and the health consequences in terms of hospitalizations and deaths, uh, 2021 has proven just as challenging as 2020. Yeah, the, the other bulwark industries, uh, construction from 2020 down 22%, Wholesale and retail down 13.5%. Any improvement in those numbers, in those two sectors, those two industries rather, in 2021 so far? Right. So, you know, the indirect um, contribution um, of tourism to our economy is about 60%. And uh, whenever you have that significant reduction in tourism, it literally affects all of the sectors. And, uh, you know, tourism, um, construction, you know, and other sectors will continue to to suffer until such time as our tourism product um, recovers. But having said that, we have had some infrastructural um, projects that would have um, taken place during the last 18 months in which we continue to build out the country's socioeconomic infrastructure in order to facilitate uh, more robust growth for come 2022. And I would say that uh, because of those interventions, um, we've been able to stem the decline in certain sectors, including the um, construction sector. So you'll find that the um, decline in the tourism in the construction sector was significantly lower than the tourism sector because of those investments. 
we have some private investments as well that are taking place. Uh, so, for example, we currently have one of the largest private sector investments in the Caribbean taking place in our sister island, Barbuda. That's a two billion US dollar project. Um, it's a project that um, <clears throat> is actually operated by or will be operated by the Discovery Land um, franchise out of the US. It's really a high end, high end, uh, yes, well, a high end project uh, catering for the wealthiest persons um, in North America and Europe. So they're attracting a lot of the industry captains who are building uh, very expensive um, uh, homes, um, luxury homes in Barbuda, ranging between 20 and 40 million US dollars each. So there's some positive um, signs, uh, positive um, activities taking place. And um, as we're able to fully reopen our country's economy and continue to attract more investments, more tourists, we anticipate that they will have strong growth in 2022, perhaps up to about 8% next year. And you would recognize too that uh, pre-COVID, we were able to uh, grow the country's economy by an average of about four and a half, just under five percent. Uh, so we believe that um, you know, with a lower base <clears throat> um, from 2022, we should, we should be able to increase um, the growth rate up to about um, eight percent, assuming that there are uh, no um, disruptions, at least significant disruptions from COVID in 2022. Yeah, yeah. Just, just before we go to the break, Prime Minister, the same project you were speaking about just now, uh, that's the PLH uh, Ocean Club uh, right. investment. So, so you, you had said, and, and I'm, I'm certain this would have changed, but just to hear it from you, uh, it was projected that about 130 million US would have been spent in 2021 netting about 400 jobs. Uh, how, how, how far away are you from that target? Or did you hit that 400 target and that investment scale? Absolutely. In fact, the investment um, has been increased about 200 million. So by the end of this year, they would have spent about 200 million US dollars. And they do have about 450 people employed. We are also um, constructing a new airport um, facility on Barbuda that be able to accommodate um, jet traffic. So we'll be perhaps the only um, island within the OECS Caribbean that will have um, two airports that are able to um, receive jets. So again, challenging period for us, but notwithstanding, you know, we're soldiering on and we are making significant progress notwithstanding. Stay where you are, Prime Minister. When we come back, we'll talk about the fiscal picture in the medium term. This is The Conversation. Uh, the Honorable Gaston Brown is my guest. More after this break. Back with us on the conversation, I'm speaking with the Gaston Brown, the Prime Minister in Antigua and Barbuda. Uh, uh, Prime Minister, your, your your primary surplus target, real medium term, because you have predict projections up to 2030. You say you want to run a primary surplus uh, target of 0.5 to 1 percent of GDP. But when you spoke that, though, your starting point was projected to be much more much stronger than your starting point actually turned out to be. So have you and your technocrats sat down to recast that number or are you still going with that as a target by the time 2030 comes? Yeah, we're still moving forward, um, you know, with that. And um, I presume, though, that there may be some deterioration in, you know, some of those um, areas. Um, we could even find ourselves um, maybe with a primary deficit. Uh, but I believe from 2022, we should, well, we should see some improvement. And um, in terms of an overall deficit, more than likely we'll be incurring deficits because we'll also have to increase our borrowings in order to respond to the, um, the let's say, the post-COVID um, um, interventions. Uh, evidently, we will have to um, spend more in order to stimulate the economy, which means that our debt GDP is likely to worsen and our overall deficit is likely to increase. But those are necessary interventions in order to um, stimulate the economy. Uh, ultimately, the only way out of this problem is to stimulate growth. And, and you know, we, we can't be slavishly, um, you know, adhering to, let's say, keeping our debt to GDP down to 
ninety uh, percent, which is what it is now. I mean, we may well have to exceed ninety percent and to go over one hundred percent in order to achieve that um, growth objective. But ultimately, we will be able to restore uh, those um, ratios to bring them down over a period of time, and hopefully by about twenty thirty, we'll be back down to uh, maybe sixty something percent of GDP. In fact, prior to COVID, we had reduced the country's debt to GDP from about 104% when we took office in 2014 down to 69%. So we feel confident in our capacity to bring those ratios down, even though there will be a temporary increase. Most of it will be driven by the fact that we have lost about um, 20% of our GDP. So as a result of that loss, there was an automatic um, increase from 69 to 69% to about 90% in terms of our debt to GDP ratio. And um, again, we anticipate significant growth, and we are hoping that within maybe two to two and a half years, we'll be able to recover um, you know, those lost gains and that we'll be able to place the country again on the path of um, fiscal sustainability. The impact, Prime Minister, of reining back those tax exemptions and duty-free waivers. I was shocked when, I think you, it was you who said it in a speech I watched some time ago, that it was almost a one-to-one -one ratio. For every dollar you collected, you were giving a dollar in waivers. And I was saying, well, Antigua and Barbuda is far more wealthy than I thought for the government to be able to, be, to, have, to have been doing that for such a long time. Well, it had become cultural. And I have to accept, though, that it is one of the things that um, we have had to do in order to attract investments. I mean, you have to understand um, we're micro states. I mean, yes. Um, uh, Jamaica, for example, Trinidad and Tobago, they are more small island states. But when you have a small state with what, 100,000 people, we're really micro states. And, um, you know, because of the small size of the economy, um, you don't have the economies of scale, you don't have the type of profit potential. And in order to make investments um, viable, you know, you, and to reduce the hurdle rates, you have to incentivize these investments um, significantly. And that in itself calls for these concessions. Uh, it's unfortunate, but it's a structural problem which is practically unavoidable. But we do accept that there was room uh, in terms of um, you know, reducing some of those concessions, especially for ongoing projects. Uh, well, the new one we recognize you have to continue to incentivize, but having gotten those um, concessions, we saw a need to tweak them and to reduce the extent of the concessions so that we can increase um, government's revenues in order to cover our obligations. Yep. In, in Jamaica and in many parts of, of, of CARICOM, a Prime Minister, the issue of inflation is a hell of a thing, I can tell you. Uh, in, in the Jamaican case, you know what's funny? The day after the Prime Minister, the, the Finance Minister, I beg your pardon, opened the, his budget, made his budget presentation in the, in the House of Representatives and announced that GCT would be reduced from 16.5% to 15%. And of course, you'd expect a, a throughput in the pocket of, well, your disposable income would increase, your marginal propensity to consume, all of those things. But the same day, well, a day after COVID was declared a pandemic and all hell broke loose from there. I say that to say that people are finding it difficult to manage the runaway increase in prices of fuel at the pumps, food and everything else. Insofar as you are concerned and those inflation expectations and the rise in inflation, how are you coping? Well, we have not seen those type of um, inflationary um, pressures, even though they remain a significant threat, especially because of the logistical chaos that we are seeing currently that will result in some at least temporary increase in prices. Uh, but within the last 18 month period, um, I would say that um, inflation has generally been on the 2%. And um, it's uh, fuel, for example, is a typical example in which we've been able to control inflationary pressures. We have this, um, let's say, price neutralization mechanism in which whenever there's an increase in fuel prices, the government's um, consumption tax um, reduces. So we've been able to keep um, prices at the pump stable. Uh, in fact, there has been no increase because of that um, price um, equalization mechanism that we have in place. I presume in the case of Jamaica and other countries, they have a pass-through mechanism. So wherever there's an increase in, um, in pricing, that you pass it on to the consumer. Uh, our inflation, for the most part, it is really um, uh, import-based. And um, unless there's a significant um, increase in prices um, for goods coming out of the United States in particular, because 80% of what we consume 
uh, those goods are imported from the United States unless there's a significant um, uh, amount of um, or increase in prices in the U.S., then we expect to continue to benefit from relatively stable rates of inflation. Uh, so it's, you know, cost push um, inflation that is import based. based. And um, so far, we have not fared too badly, even though I have to tell you that as a result of the logistics um, chaos that, has, that is happening globally, uh, especially in terms of trade between the United States and China, and even the backup um, on the, the um, West Coast uh, in the United States, we're now seeing uh, even some food items. I mean, uh, even things like um, produce, lettuce, and so on, we've seen some significant increase in pricing. So I'm pretty sure that there's going to be an impact. Um, and as we do the assessment, which is done retroactively, that we would have um, recognized that there was an increase in food prices. But again, that's one component of the basket. At least we know the energy part of it. Uh, based on the fact that um, we have this uh, mechanism to absorb the increase in prices, that, yes. that will not necessarily result in any increase in consumer prices. But I can see us ticking up maybe by 1%, getting up to about 3% um, within the next um, few weeks and months. Yeah. On the point of COVID, Prime Minister, uh, reports out of your country suggest that some private sector entities playing loose and fast with this this vaccine mandate and the, the, the discipline where the, 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 the COVID protocols are concerned, that, that, that discipline doesn't exist in, in, in some cases. How, how is your government addressing this, or these things, rather? Well, you know, it's a double-edged sword. I mean, we know that there will be political consequences from the mandates, but we saw those mandates as absolutely important to protect lives and livelihoods. Uh, for us, the vaccine mandates really represent a call to duty, and we expect um, you know, Antigas and Babylons to respond accordingly and to join this fight to defeat this invisible um, enemy, um, COVID. Uh, the, the, the number of entities that have fought us, um, a couple of unions would have taken us to court, and there um, have been a lot of um, push, uh, political um, pushback. We have had um, protestations. But we continue to stand our ground and to soldier on because we know ultimately what we're doing here is in the best interest of the people of Antigua and Barbuda. The mandates are designed to increase vaccination so as to contain hospitalizations and deaths and at the same time to facilitate a speedy recovery because, you know, having taken a battering uh, for the last um, 20 months from COVID, the economy cannot um, take a further battering and we have to move forward um, with some degree of predictability and um, you know purpose going into 2022 um, as we seek to recover economy put our people back to work and to restore their living standards I mean to do otherwise would be literally placing our political fortunes above the lives and livelihoods of our people and I've said to my colleagues in the government that we have an obligation you know, to act in the best interest of the people always, notwithstanding the political consequences. Yeah. And do you, do you, in hindsight, would you do again the imposition of the vaccine mandate for students 12 and older uh, to facilitate face-to-face -face learning in schools? Because that, that has been thorny in some quarters, it would seem. Well, you know, I have said to the people of Antigua and Barbuda that as it stands now, and certainly what has happened during the last 20 months, we have seen significant educational regression. Currently, because of um, the social distancing requirements of students, uh, they can only do two, three days a week um, face to face. And that is totally unacceptable. That is not sufficient contact time for them to perform, you know, in this global competitive space. So if we continue this dispensation, we'll be placing our students at a disadvantage. Now, I'll accept that the primary school students and those below, they have recovery time, but those are in our secondary schools. They have little recovery time, especially those who will be uh, faced to the exams next year, and even our uh, Cape students. So it's important for them to get vaccinated so that they can go back to school on a daily basis and to have the uh, necessary contact time to equip them so they could pass the exams and so that they can excel. I mean, to do otherwise will be to prejudice um, the education. 
So again, vaccine mandates are important to create that type of safe environment within our secondary schools so that we do not um, continue to prejudice the development of our youth. Uh, some people may see it as punitive, but we've taken a position that we need to get at least 90% of um, those students um, inoculated. And we have uh, mandates of teachers as well. We have um, achieved over 90% of our teachers who are now inoculated. Then we can literally go back to almost business as usual within our secondary schools, um, obviously maintaining the protocols, uh, uh, but then you can have um, maybe um, three feet distance rather than six feet, which is the current um, protocol and to accommodate um, all the students on a face-to-face -face basis, on a daily basis for what, um, six, seven hours a day. Uh, that is absolutely necessary. Otherwise we're gonna see a significant amount of um, educational regression, which ultimately will be, you know, it's an easy decision um, not to mandate, but the consequences of, you know, presiding over educational regression will be far worse. Yeah, stay where you are, Prime Minister. Only left more minutes in my company, and then you'll be free to carry on your day. Gaston Brown, the Prime Minister of Antigua and Barbuda, is here. We return for a final segment after these. Back with us on the conversation, the Prime Minister of Antigua and Barbuda, Gaston Brown, is with me. Uh, Prime Minister, you were born in 1967? No? Correct. 67, Correct. good. All right. So I say that for a reason. Uh, can you understand why my generation, born in the 80s, the, so the 80s generation forward, find it almost impossible to get excited by CARICOM, given that unlike your generation, we have seen nothing being consistently built, nothing being consistently improved upon. So we, all, we always wonder, well, that's a dead, that's a moribund organization. That is something that is almost anachronistic. And uh, perhaps it is that's why we're still here trying to implement the CSME so long after the structure and the framework was put in place. I see you smiling. Well, you know, I, I think um, we've been very hard on um, Garakum as a necessary <laughs> institution, uh, one that was created to ensure economic um, integration and at the same time to ensure that there's foreign, par foreign policy coordination and so on. And ultimately, you know, it is designed to improve the living standards of the people of the Caribbean region. And it's a very necessary institution. Now, a lot of people have looked um, beyond the successes in functional cooperation within um, CARICOM. And that is certainly one of the areas in which um, CARICOM would have benefited um, the people of, of, of Antigua and Barbuda, the broader Caribbean, uh, for uh, the past several decades, since 1973. Uh, I would accept that perhaps we should have made uh, more progress Press and in many instances, you know, we didn't give CARICOM the type of um, attention that it deserves, the type of energy in order to accelerate the full operationalization of the single market and, eco and, and economy. You know, it's, it's work in progress. But I have to tell you that in as much as achieving a single economy will continue to be a challenge because, you know, there's some issues in terms of currency, conver um, um, currency um, convergence and so on. Uh, I think the, the, the actual um, single market itself uh, would have helped because there are many CARICOM products that are less expensive than goods imported um, from, you know, extra regionally. Uh, so that in itself uh, would have helped to contain the cost of living within the Caribbean um, space. Uh, obviously, there's room for greater collaboration for increased um, trade among countries and those are issues that we're looking at. In fact, as you look at the logistics and chaos taking place globally, the need for strengthening the integration movement and to produce more, especially in terms of um, agricultural um, products, ensure food, food security and nutrition within the region becomes even more urgent. Uh, so in as much as we may have our misgivings about the rate of progress, the current uh, challenges and threats that we are faced with uh, necessitate the closer collaboration and cooperation among um, Caribbean countries, especially within the CARICOM framework, 
in order to address these existential threats um, facing the region. Let me frame this, this, this next point, Prime Minister, thank you for that answer, in this way. You would understand, of course, how Jamaicans feel about the departed Gordon Butch Stewart. And uh, when, of course, from a business perspective, you clashed with Gordon Butch Stewart, many Jamaicans were taken aback. Some people said, wait, who is this man pronouncing in this manner about Gordon Wood Stewart. Others said, hmm, I respect that man for standing up in the way that he did because he, he, he's doing what many people are seemingly afraid to do. So it's in that context I put this to you. I'm going to read back uh, for you some words that were attributed to you on January 5 this year. So I'm quoting you now, Prime Minister. The Caribbean has lost an iconic son a pioneer and revered businessman whose legacy includes the development of the region's premier hotel brand, Sandals. His contribution towards the socio-economic development of the region is well appreciated, and he was held in high esteem by all as one of the most successful Caribbean entrepreneurs, inspiring entrepreneurship throughout the region. And that's how you ended it. So, given your cantankerous relationship with Gordon Butch Stewart, Prime Minister. And look, hold on, I could have said rancorous, but rancor means bitterness and resentment, and I'm not ascribing those things to you. So I chose cantankerous, which means rowdy. Given that rowdy relationship, are we to believe, Prime Minister, that those words about Gordon Butch Stewart were sincere, coming from Gaston Brown? Absolutely, 100%. Uh, um, if you know me, I say what I mean, and I mean what I say. So I don't play those um, diplomatic games. If I felt that those accolades were not deserving, I would not have um, so stated. Uh, you know, but Stuart um, is easily one of the most um, successful entrepreneurs emanating out of the Caribbean, and uh, we're all very respectful of um, his achievements. And I have to tell you that, look, as Caribbeaners, from time to time, we will have familial fights. And what transpired um, with um, the late Bustrot was a... a a family fight in which I felt that um, he was doing something that was most inappropriate. And many people do not understand the issue at the time. Uh, God um, but Stuart was able to fashion the issue as a tax issue, uh, a concession issue. It was not. You know that all countries, they have their um, GST tax. They, in our case, we call it an ABST, the Antigua and Barbuda Sales Tax. So every tourist who comes to the country has to pay about 12.5%. What seemed to have happened um, on the previous administration is that um, uh, Sir Gordon uh, Woodstrode was able to get a previous administration to uh, uh, have him hold on to 65% of the proceeds, and the government only got 35%. Now, you have to take that in the context of a business that doesn't pay any taxes, maybe only on food and beverage, everything else that um, the hotel um, imports into the country pays nothing, gets them um, uh, to get them in duty free, free of all duties and taxes, doesn't pay any corporation taxes. So other than the employment, you have the benefit for the government of Antigua and Barbuda is the sales tax. Now, in essence, uh, that tax uh, it, it belongs to the government and people of Antigua and Barbuda. I mean, Sanders is just um, literally the custodian of it. Um, they hold the money in trust for the government and people of Antigua and Barbuda. And it was inappropriate for him to hold on to 65% or Sandals in that matter to hold on to 65% of those um, proceeds. And if you know Gordon, I mean, Gordon could be a very ruthless man. And I have to tell you, I believe that's one of the reasons why he was so successful. He was absolutely fearless, ruthless. But I had to stand up for the people of Antigua and Barbuda. And we said to him, there's no way that you're going to continue this abuse. So what we did, we wrote off $101 million that he would have benefited from in the prior years. And we said to him, going forward, you have to pay it. His position was, I'm not going to pay it. And I said to him, you have to pay it. You have no choice. So we exchanged um, choice words. He obviously, you know, have his uh, media entities and was able to, uh, let's say, skew uh, the, the, the real <laughs> issue or the facts associated with this case. And, you know, I have no difficulty with it. I mean, he was trying to maintain a particular um, source of revenue, which he wasn't entitled to, and he did what he had to do. I said what I had to say, but it doesn't take away from the measure of the man and the success of Gordon Bustrode as a pioneer in the uh, accommodation sector and as one of the most successful um, businessmen that we have seen 
uh, you know, in the history of our modern civilization. P perhaps at the height of, of that clash, Prime Minister, I recall you in Parliament saying that you had gotten, I, 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 I don't recall the occasion, it may have been your birthday, you got uh, perhaps a bottle or two of Dom P from Gordon Boot Stewart and you told your colleagues that, well, I don't drink, so anybody who wants it is welcome to uh, take this gift off my hands. Did anybody take that up or do you still have those bottles of bubble? No, in fact, I still have it on my shelf at home. <laughs> but I have to tell you, I have to tell you that, um, you know, before um, God was to died, um, you know, he was very complimentary and we rekindled our relationship. I recall when we opened up um, our uh, borders back in June of last year, the 1st of June, I would have given a commitment to God was short in April, literally a month after we had our first um, COVID case. I said to him, come June, we will open our borders. I said to him, look, this thing will be endemic from all indications. And we have to learn to work and live with COVID. Unlike other countries that have decided that they're going to close for months, maybe a year, 18 months, we will be open come June 1st. And God said to me, look, you know what, Prime Minister, if there's one leader in the Caribbean region whose words I know is golden and that a leader who stand by his word, it's you. Yes. And he said to me, I'm going to make arrangements to ensure that Sandals reopens on the 1st of June. Yes. Based on the commitment that you give. So, and I tell you this much, I didn't know that he was that ill because uh, I believe about um, two days before um, he, he passed, um, you know, I had a message from a mutual um, um, a friend of ours, um, you know, expressing uh, best wishes, um, the Christmas as well, Christmas last year. Um, if I have my data right, um, he uh, would have uh, messaged me and uh, would have spoken subsequently. So I would say that, you know, um, yes, we had this little female fight. And again, because of who Butchwood, um was, there's no way that you could fight um, Butchwood, um you know, through any form of um, diplomacy or uh, there's no way you could have acquiesced. Yeah, just stand toe to toe with him. I mean, the man was brutal. He was ruthless, and I don't say this in a pejorative way. Yes, it was just his character. He was not afraid. Yes, Prime Minister. As we close, you won St. John City West with forty-eight point six four percent of the vote in ninety-nine, fifty-one point seven six in twenty o four. Be patient with me. Fifty-four point nine seven percent in two thousand nine. Sixty-five point five seven in twenty fourteen. 71.53% in 2018. So from my simple arithmetic, don't need maths for this, you moved your share of votes by 22.89 percentage points across five elections. So I, I, I saw these numbers and I said, well, how do I ask him a question on this? So I'm settling on this. Given this rise, this steady rise, every year after year, you do better than the year before, from 99 to 2018. Do you ever, Prime Minister, feel politically invulnerable in Antigua and Barbuda? No, there is no such thing as political invulnerability. Uh, but what I'll say here is that I inherited um, a strong opposition seat, one of those, uh, what do you call them in Jamaica, um, garrisons. Yes, yeah, CF seats. So when I ran in um, 20, uh, 1999 for the first time, uh, the polls would have indicated I would have lost, but I won marginally and was able to build on um, that position until I got up to over 70%. And I imagine it is indicative of the uh, support and the respect for my representation. And I'm very happy with the confidence and trust that my constituents would have reposed in me to the extent that I became um, you know, prime minister. So it has moved from a garrison to the opposition, um, UPP party, to a garrison now to the Labour Party. Hear you on that. Prime Minister, that's all the time we have. Thank you for speaking with me today and all the best. If we can go, just get West Indies cricket to improve, we'd be a bit happier, eh? By the way, Antigua is going to lead that transformation. <laughs> Mark my word. Hear you on that. I'm holding you to that, Prime Minister. Thank you. Absolutely. Hold me to that. Excellent. Gaston Cheers. Brown, Prime Minister Antigua and Barbuda. That's the conversation for today.